Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the show. This is Nico Perino, and this is So to Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. Today, I am in Fire's Washington, D.C. office because we have a cool episode on tap for you all. We are heading to the Maryland suburbs of D.C. today to meet a man that you all have actually met before. His name is Daryl Davis. My name is Daryl Davis. I'm age 58. I was born in Chicago, Illinois on March 26, 1958. Daryl is a professional musician who throughout his career has ran in the circles of some of the 20th century's Brad biggest Dominic, celebrities. Frazier, Dolly Parton, Keith Richards, Chuck Berry, Muddy Waters, Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, Ray Charles, Carl Perkins, Liberace, Willie Nelson. I got a few more around here. If you listen to the first episode of So to Speak with Jonathan Rausch, you might recall Daryl's name. During the episode, we played a clip of his interview with another podcast called Love and Radio. The most important thing that I learned was that while you are actively learning about someone else, you are passively teaching them about yourself. In that podcast, Daryl talks about his very curious pastime of befriending members of the Ku Klux Klan, and through that friendship, through discourse, through dialogue, he demonstrates to them that their prejudices are unfounded. So much so that today, Daryl has at his home dozens of Klan robes given to him by former Klan members who gave up their racism after meeting him. This is a robe of an imperial wizard, the top guy. This is a white cotton robe with blue adornments, blue stripes, blue sash, and blue cape. And of course you see the Klan emblem, the Mayoke. Daryl is a black man, and he's devoted his life, in part, to a faith in the power of friendship and free and open dialogue to transcend differences. He actually wrote a book about these experiences. It's called Clandestine Relationships, A Black Man's Odyssey in the Ku Klux Klan. You challenge them, but you don't challenge them rudely or violently. You do it politely and intelligently. And when you do things that way, chances are they will reciprocate. I first reached out to Daryl to come on the podcast after that first episode with Jonathan Rausch. And unfortunately, I was unable to get through to him. But recently, my colleague Chris Maltby told me that PBS is coming out with a documentary about Daryl's life and about his practice of befriending members of the KKK. So, naturally, I reached out to the producers of this documentary, which comes out on Monday, February 13th, and is called Accidental Courtesy, Daryl Davis, Race and America. Accidental Courtesy, now only on Independent Lens. By the time you all hear this podcast, the documentary will actually be out, so I encourage you all to go check it out. Thankfully for you all, the producers of the documentary were able to connect me with Daryl. Now, I'm a musician, and I try to be a courteous one. (laughs) Okay. So today, I'm heading out to Maryland to meet Daryl, and we're going to talk not only about the documentary and the discussions and friendships he's developed with members of the KKK, But we're also going to talk about how free speech plays into what he does and how open dialogue and debate has allowed him to help inadvertently break down the prejudices of some of the most extreme members of our society. It's January 30th here in D.C. It's snowing outside. And me and my colleague at FIRE, Nate O'Connor, are about to hit the red line, head up to Maryland, and meet Daryl. Step back. Doors closing. So Nate, you uh, you were the one that originally told me about Daryl Davis and uh, that Love and Radio episode. How did you hear about it? Yeah, one day I was just running errands and I was listening to Love and Radio's The Silver Diner. Or, uh, I think sorry. it's a Silver Dollar. Silver Dollar, yeah, you're right. Um, silver Diner is a local establishment here. <laughs> it just took me off guard. I, I thought with a title like that, you know, I just wasn't expecting there to be such depth and really kind of floored me. Doors opening. 
step back to him now. All right, we got to meet him at 3.30. It's a busy street. Georgia Ave. All right, we're going to take a left. Right, left right here. Is this it? Right here? Yeah. All right. Hey, Daryl. Good to see you, Good to meet man. you, Nico. Daryl, my pleasure. This is uh, Nate. He works Hi. with me. Nate, how you doing, buddy? Good. How are you? Anybody else? Nope, just okay. the two of us. Okay. No, the rest of the field trips around the corner, they'll be here. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Have a seat. All right. You still do gigs and things like that? Yeah, I just did one this past Saturday night in Bethesda, Maryland. Did you? Yeah, I'm missing my phone. Yeah, yeah I'd love to um, keep that on my radio. Where's that coming from? The Let's Chuck Berry music over there? Yeah. <laughs> Johnny Be Good? Yeah. I played with Chuck for 32 yeah. years. Yeah. Oh, you play, You were in his band? Yeah. Right, no shit. <laughs> wow. All right, well, we can get started. Daryl, thanks for coming on the show. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So in watching the documentary, Accidental Courtesy, I get the sense that to really understand your approach to the world and your approach to fighting racism, it's important to understand your background, how you grew up. Absolutely. And so can you tell us a little bit about your background and how that shapes, in particular, your approach to befriending members of the KKK? Indeed. I had a background that most Americans, most of my peers, never had. My parents were in the U.S. Foreign Service, so I grew up as an American embassy brat, and uh, we served overseas. You get assigned to a country for two years, and then you return turn home back here to the States. You're here for like nine months a year, and then you get reassigned abroad again. Yeah. When I was overseas uh, in the 1960s in grade school, elementary school, my classes were full of, of students from Nigeria, Italy, France, Germany, Japan, Russia. Anybody who had an embassy in those particular countries, all, all the kids, we all went to the same school. International schools. International schools, exactly. Yeah. So looking at, at, at a classroom, you would say it looks like a little United Nations or something. When, when I was overseas, I was multicultural. But when I would return home to the States, I was either in all black schools or black and white schools, depending upon whether I was going to the newly integrated school or the still segregated one. And there was not the amount of diversity in the classroom that I had overseas, which is black kids or white kids. I was living 12 to 15 years ahead of my time. I was living 12 to 15 years into the future because that multicultural little United Nations scenario had yet to come to this country. It wouldn't come here for a little over a decade. I could never understand why a lot of my peers back home you know, felt um, an, an adversity to someone who was different because of their skin color, because of their religion, because of the clothes they wore from their from their native land or, or traditional uh, dressing, you know, that kind of thing. Um, between traveling with my parents as a child on my dad's assignments for the State Department, combined with the travels of myself as an adult, as a professional musician, I've been in a, in a total today of 53 different countries on six continents. So I've literally been exposed to many, many different colors, uh, religions, ethnicities, uh, etc. And all of that has helped shape who I've become. I was around people from all over the world when I was, you know, uh, you know pre two digits, less than 10 years old. And we got along fantastic. We may not all have spoken the same language, but we knew how to play together. We, we learned to get along with each other. There was never an obstacle. I did not encounter obstacles until I came to my own country. I mean, I was born here, of course, but every time I'd come back, I'd run into obstacles. I lived in Belmont, Massachusetts, and we were one of two black families in the entire area. Consequently, all of my friends were white. And um, during the summer, you know, I'd hang out with, uh, with my friends. And one time we went to the public sw uh, swimming pool nearby. And I remember I got in and a lot of people got out. And I remember going to, uh, to the locker room you know, after we were done swimming. And uh, a kid in the, um, in the locker room called me a nigger. 
there was a girl in my class. And one time during the summer, my guy friends and I were out playing kickball on the school playground. And in the distance, I could hear a girl saying, nigger, nigger, but I ignored her. And she kept saying, nigger, nigger, and getting closer. And then she would say, nigger, do you watch Niggerama? And I'm trying to, I'm hearing her, and I'm trying to ignore her. And finally she got right up, right up to my ear, right behind me, and yelled it in my ear. And I spun around to get her. She took off running. And a couple of my friends, well, several of my friends ran around the block in both directions and trapped her. And they dragged her back to the playground. I was standing up against the uh, chain link fence. And I just, I had my arms stretched out with my back against the fence. And I had, you know, put my fingers through the holes and just hold on the fence. And they dragged her up in front of me and held her in front of me and made her tell me that she was sorry. Mm -hmm. These are these white guys, friends of mine, right? And half the other guys standing around kept going, slap her, slap her. You know, now half of them wanted to see a fight, like most mm -hmm. boys do. And the other half really felt that she deserved it. I was, I was immobilized. I could not let go of the fence. Mm -hmm. Something was literally, some, you know, you would call it supernatural, whatever you want to call it. I call it divine intervention. Was holding me against that fence. I could not release the fence. She apologized. Mm -hmm. And I told them to let her go. And she, when they let her go, she took off running. Mm -hmm. And when she got out of my line of sight, my hands fell out of the holes in the fence. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you right now, I truly believe that was divine intervention. Because at the age of 10, I had absolutely no idea what the consequences would have been had a black male beat up or hurt or, or cussed out or whatever. Mm -hmm. A, uh, a white female. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go just uh, a little over 10 years before that, uh, the story of Emmett Till, all he did was whistle at a white woman and he ended up being murdered and mutilated and shot and thrown in, into a river. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I consider that a divine intervention. In 1974, I was 15 years old in the 10th grade. And we had a class called the POTC in high school in Rockville, Maryland, which stood for Problems of the 20th Century. And I, we had a fantastic teacher who would always invite in these very interesting speakers. And on this particular day for this class, he had the head of the American Nazi Party, the guy who took over for George Lincoln Rockwell, Matt Cole, come to my school. And that could never happen today. But back in 1974, you know, things were different. There was no such thing as political correctness and all that kind of thing. So he was there, and he came with his right-hand lieutenant, a fellow named Martin Kerr. And these two gentlemen stood at the head of my class, espousing the views of white supremacy. There was another black guy in the class, and at some point, Matt Cole looked at me and pointed at me and pointed at the other black guy and said, we're going to ship you back to Africa. And he pointed, he like a sweeping motion with his finger, uh, to, to the whole classroom and said, and all you Jews out there, you're going back to Israel. And I had never heard an adult speak like that before. And I wasn't, I wasn't afraid, but I was kind of taken aback and not quite sure what to make of him. Uh, you know, what's this guy talking about? Who, who gives him that authority? And while I'm sitting there, uh, you know, I, I wanted to confront him but, but I couldn't because my upbringing, you know, my generation, we were taught to respect your elders as figures of authority, whether it's your next door neighbor, the mailman, the cop, you know, your teacher, whoever was older than you is, is a figure of authority. And so I didn't say anything. I just sat there. And one of my classmates piped up and said, well, what happens if they don't go? And Matt Cole said, oh, they have no choice. If they do not leave voluntarily, they will be exterminated in the upcoming race war. That was the first time I ever heard the term race war. And I had no idea what this man was talking about. Was he talking about the Civil War? I mean, come on. That thing was, was over in 1865. What's this race war he's talking about? And later on that day, uh, I was standing by my locker 
getting something out of it. And here comes Matt Cole and Martin Kerr. You know, they, they'd been in the school half the day doing other P POTC classes, and now they were leaving. I was the only one in the hallway along with them. And as they came to walk past me, they paused right in front of me. They didn't say a word to me. They just paused and looked at me and sneered at me. And then they started laughing and went on past me and down the hall towards the front door. That was the turning point in my life. Yes, I'd had racist experiences before, and I had a question in my mind, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? But I had no idea where to try to get that answer. I, you know, there, there, were, there were no resources for things like that, you know, and no classes you could take. But that day turned me around, and I said, I have to find that answer. How can you hate me when you don't even know me? And I began going out and purchasing everything I could find on black supremacy, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, the Ku Klux Klan, the Nazis in Germany, the neo-Nazis over here. I want to learn about that ideology. I have a vast library of those books and things like that. I read them all. I knew that people were not born with that ideology. It came from somewhere. So where did it come from? Where's it going? How can it be addressed? Let's talk about what happened at the, the Silver Dollar Lounge. Okay, the Silver Dollar Lounge. So I graduated with my degree in music from Howard University in 1980, and um, I, I joined a country band. And we played at a place up in Frederick, Maryland, yep. called the uh, Silver Dollar Lounge. And I came off the bandstand on the first uh, break and was walking across the dance floor to sit with my, uh, my bandmates. And a white gentleman got up from his table and walked across the dance floor and put his arm around my shoulder from behind. And I stopped and turned around to see who was touching me because all my band was down there. And he says, hey, I really enjoy your all's music. I said, thank you, I appreciate that. And I shook his hand. He was fascinated with me and wanted to buy me a drink. Now, I don't drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. So I went back to his table with him. He called the waitress over, asked me what I wanted. I got a cranberry juice. She went and got it. And then he took his glass and he clinks my glass. And he says, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a, with, with a black man. Now I'm really intrigued and I'm surprised. This is, this is no anomaly to me. In my 25 years, I had sat down with literally thousands of white people or anybody else and had a beverage, a meal, a conversation. And this guy was probably in his mid to late 40s. He'd never sat down with a black guy before. So again, I said, why? And he didn't answer me. He stared at the tabletop. And um, I said, why? I repeated it. And his buddy elbowed him and said, tell him, tell him, tell him. And I said, well, tell me. He went inside his pocket, pulled out his wallet, flipped through it, and handed me his clan card. He looked back at me, just deadpan face, and said, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. He gave me his phone number, and he wanted me to call him anytime I was to return to the Silver Dollar Lounge, let him know, because he wanted to bring his friends, meaning his Klansmen and Klanswomen uh, friends, to come see this black guy piano playing. Now, I'm not sure when he talked to them that he used the term black guy. He might have used some other term, right? But uh, anyway, uh, we were there like every six weeks on a rotation with other bands. Mm -hmm. So I'd call him on a Wednesday or a Thursday and say, hey man, you know, we're gonna be out of the dollar on uh, Friday and Saturday, come on out. He'd come out. He'd bring Klansmen and Klanswomen. They'd, they'd come and they would dance to our music and, and watch me play the piano. They, they, you know, they did not come in robes and hoods. They came dressed, you know, in street clothes. And so uh, they would gather out and watch me. And then when I would finish, I would, you know, the set or whatever on break, I would usually go over to his table, say hello, see how he's doing. And some of them would hang out there and shake my hand and want to meet me and talk to me. Others would kind of scurry away when they saw me coming. They didn't want anything to do with me. They didn't want to touch me, talk to me, nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to observe me, but at a distance, not get close. So they would scurry away, and that was fine. I didn't care. So I would sit down and, and, you know, shoot the breeze with whoever was there. And this went on until the end of uh, 1983. I quit the band. In 1984, I went back to playing rock and roll and blues and R&B and whatever else was going on in 1984. Well, about six years later, I decided I want to write a book. 
I want to, you know, I need the answer to my to my question. How can you hate me? When you don't even know me. And then it, it popped into my mind. You know, I blew it. I should have asked that guy, that Klansman. Who better to ask? How can you hate me when you don't even know me than to ask someone who would join an organization whose whole premise is hating those who do not look like them or who do not believe as they believe. So I decided I'm going to go around the country. I'm going to start here in Maryland where I live, interview the head of the clan, clan members, go up north, go down south, go to the Midwest, go to the West, and interview all these different clan people and get the answer to my question. I was not setting out to convert anybody. I was simply setting out to find out how can you hate me when you don't even know me. Because mm -hmm. see, once you find that out and you, and you can, can get a, a grasp on it or grip on it and, and di dissect it, then maybe you could find a solution and, and, and bridge that, that divide. But you have to know why somebody hates you first before you can try to solve the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're, through this investigation, yeah. you found your solution. Essentially, did you find it? The solution is that by talking to people and trying yeah. to understand them, giving them a platform to discuss their beliefs, and then demonstrating to them that their prejudices are mis are unfounded, are unfounded, or, or misinformed. Absolutely, you know. And uh, it, I, I happened upon this by accident. Mm -hmm. I had not set out to make friends with anybody in the clan. That was not my mission, and it was not my mission to convert them. It was just to question them. You know, my my line of thinking was, you know, they believe what they believe, and they're gonna and they're gonna continue believing what they believe, because you know, as as a child, I'm sure you've heard the the cliche, um, a leopard doesn't change its spots or a tiger doesn't yep. change its stripes. So that's what I felt about clan people. You know, they are what they are, and they're not gonna change. Most of them did not know that I was black when the interviews were set up. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, you know, when they would show up, they'd freak out. Or in some cases, you know, uh, I was invited over to their home because they're thinking, you know, this white guy's going to come over. Or they assume this guy's coming over to interview me uh, about my experiences in the Klan. And they assume that he's white because there are no black people writing books on the Klan. Mine mm -hmm. was the first one. Yeah. So uh, after they'd freak out, you know, they'd get over it. Some of them would talk to me. Some of them said, no, I'm not talking to you. And that was the end of that. And a couple of them, you know, wanted to fight. So that, you know, that would happen. When, when, you, when I first began talking with them, uh, they were not interested in anything I had to say other than my questions. They would answer my questions or they would say, I, I, I'm not going to discuss that. You know, if they didn't want to go into, into some kind of detail that was private to the clan or something. Um, but they would answer, you know, the other questions, but they would not reciprocate. Like, for example, if I were to say, so what do you think about Martin Luther King? They would tell me exactly what they thought about Martin Luther King, but they wouldn't say, well, what do you think about him? You know, mm -hmm. they, they, they didn't want to hear what I had to say mm -hmm. because I was inferior. I'm a black man. They're superior. They're white. Mm -hmm. So nothing I had to say was of any relevance or any importance to them. So I, I had nothing of value to give them. Mm -hmm. And then over time, uh, be it months weeks, whatever, they would say, well, Darryl, you know, what, what do you think about it? All of a sudden I realized, whoa, hey, I, I, I've made some headway here. I, I've broken some ice or something. Now all of a sudden my opinion has value. They want to know what I think about such and such a situation or so-and-so. You know, and I'd express my point of view. And then we could have a back and forth conversation. And that was enlightening for a lot of them. And they began to see me, not so much as that black guy sitting across from them asking, asking them questions, but as a human being, someone who had a voice, someone who spoke the same exact language they did and spoke it as well as they did, if not better than they did. Mm -hmm. Someone who knew a lot about the Klan, someone who knew as much about the Klan as they did, if not even more than they knew about their own organization. And so whether they liked you or not, they had to respect your, the fact that you knew about their organization and that impressed them. And so I sought out clan leaders and members starting here where I'm from Chicago originally, but starting here in Maryland where I live. 
And this is the 80s? Uh, no. Well, I, I ran into a bunch of them in the 80s, but I started writing the book in, in 1990 mm. and, um, or 91. And I, um, I started here with clan people in Maryland, and then I went up north, down south, Midwest, and west. So in the process of talking with these people, I'm realizing that they're human beings, but they have flaws. They're realizing that I'm a human being and I might have a little more to offer them than they already have. And they see things that they otherwise would not have seen. They're seeing them vicariously through me. And some of them are beginning to change. You know, time after time, people began quitting and telling me, you know, you know, you made me think about something, you know, and I, I'm leaving the clan, I'm quitting, I'm throwing, away my, I'm throwing away my stuff. So I thought, wow, I'm onto something. I need to keep doing this. Talking with people is the key. Not talking about them or talking at them, but talking with them is the key. You know, there's no benefit to hiding the truth and burying things that we don't want to deal with, all right? Racism is as American as baseball, apple pie, and Chevrolet. And so is the Ku Klux Klan. These are, it's a shameful part of our history, but nonetheless, it is our history, and it has to be addressed. And people are, are so afraid to have conversations because they feel that they have to walk around on eggshells or they might offend somebody. How are we gonna progress if somebody is afraid to talk to you? I, I, I believe in telling it like it is. You know, if you spend five minutes with your worst enemy, you will find that you have something in common. If you spend 10 minutes, you'll find you, you even have more in common. And the more you find that you have in common and build upon those things, the less things that you have in contrast will begin to matter, like skin color. And so you build upon those commonalities, and next thing you know, you're in a relationship with this person. And then the relationship turns into a friendship. Mm -hmm. And I have this, this, uh, this belief of my own, that when two enemies are talking, they're not fighting, they're talking. They might be yelling and screaming and uh, beating their fists on the table to drive home their point you know, of, of disagreement or whatever but at least they're talking. It's when the talking ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So you wanna keep the conversation going. And that's what I did. I allowed them to say whatever they want to say, use whatever language they want to use. I said, you know, I want you to use whatever language you use behind closed doors at your clan meeting in front of me. I said, I'm not gonna take offense. I said, I want you to be yourself. I allowed them to be themselves, express whatever, Sometimes, you know, they, tr they tried to push my buttons to see how far yeah. they could go. They didn't get pushed, you know? And then over time, they would begin to moderate. The, the, uh, they, they wouldn't use the word nigger. They would say, well, you know, this black man did this or da-da-da-da, you know, or, or colored person, whatever. Um, you know, they began modifying that language. And, and it was out of respect for me. And then I, I would get invited to Klan rallies. I would go to these Klan rallies. I'd watch them, you know, light up this cross and parade around and shout white power and for God, for race, for country, all kinds of stuff. Uh, at one clan, clan rally, I even got a standing ovation uh, just for showing up. Mm -hmm. You'll find um, a lot of decency and a lot of humanity in some people who get caught up in something that, that sometimes even they don't understand. Or perhaps they, they were participating in it but now after meeting you, they, they're looking at it in a different light and, and they, and they reevaluate their thinking. Yeah, so now I got, I got clan robes and clan hoods and various other uh, clan paraphernalia, which I'm gonna use to open a, a museum one day. This is a clan rally banner uh, from a clan leader who, uh, who became a, a good friend of mine and, uh, and gave it up. Hmm. This is the robe of an imperial wizard. And, of course, this is the hood. They also call it a helmet. This is called the mask. The mask has two eyelets so people can peep at you if they, um, 
want to remain anonymous. If they don't care, the mask has three snaps. Just unsnap the mask, pull it off, and your face is exposed under the hood. And how many clan robes do you have now? Currently, I have probably between 25 and 28. Mm -hmm. All from mostly people that you've convinced to leave the clan or yeah, through I mean, developing the... Exactly. Yeah, developed relationships yeah. with and then they as were, a result. They were active members at the time. And I have a lot of, you know, other things besides clan robes. I have tons of stuff. Mm -hmm. People say, you know, how can you have that stuff? Why, do you why don't you burn it? Well, again, you know, I'm glad that I have it. The fact that I have it means that the person who wore it no longer wears it. And why? Because they no longer believe in what it stands for. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I have it so I can show people. And I'll put this in the museum so we never forget how far we've come and, and where we were. So that's why I keep this as American history. Yeah. It's a shameful part of our history, but nonetheless, it is our history. Wow. There's a very tense moment in the documentary where you head up to Baltimore and talk with the new wave of anti-racism activists. And you have quite the disagreement with them about their approach. Yeah. You can be in the streets building with people, right? So stop wasting your time going into people's houses that don't love you, a house where they want to throw you under the basement. So you believe that nobody can change? Is this new to you? No, it's not new to me. Um, it wasn't so much that I was disagreeing with them as they were disagreeing with me. Yeah, they made it seem, I'm a white guy. Yeah. Obviously, you can't, <laughs> you can't see me on this podcast. By the but... way, I'm a black guy. You can't <laughs> see me either. But, uh... Uh, but it seemed to me like they were coming across as saying white people can't change. Right. And all white people are racist. Well, uh, what he said specifically was that white supremacists could not change. White supremacists can't change. You don't believe they can change? No, white supremacists can't change. But I can change your mind because you look like me. Um, you know, and that, and that they did not understand how racist they were, et cetera. Pardon me? Well, I got to get along with them. Because they are our fellow Americans. We all have to live in this country. If you want to say something mm -hmm. about uh, Black Lives Matter, that a lot of listeners um, are not familiar with and probably don't understand. Black Lives Matter uh, was, was formed for good reasons and for good intentions. It was formed to bring awareness to the, to the general public, especially the white general public, about innocent black men or even uh, suspected uh, black men who may have committed crimes, mm -hmm. who were being murdered, there is no other word, murdered by white police officers uh, for holding their cell phone, for holding a wallet, uh, things like that. There is growing outrage tonight after an unarmed African-American teenager was shot and killed by police in the St. Louis suburb of Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, whereby a white person who was innocent or perhaps a suspect, did not get shot to death, shot 40 times for holding a cell phone or a wallet. Mm -hmm. So Black Lives Matter f was formed to, to bring that to attention, to put the national spotlight on that. Well, unfortunately, what has happened with Black Lives Matter is it is not a centralized movement. There are 50 or 60 different Black Lives Matter groups across the country. But the, each one is autonomous. Mm -hmm. They all believe a certain way, this is the way to do things, where, where another one believes something else. For example, I had some Black Lives Matter people in Detroit contact me and approve of what I was doing and ask for my advice. How can they get involved? How can they do that? Also had a couple in New York ask me the same thing. How can they talk across lines yeah, of differences? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and the ones in Baltimore, uh, they were very anti. There we go. Now this guy, all right. When I was in my late teens, he got arrested and convicted. He served four years in prison for conspiring to bomb a synagogue up on Liberty Road in Baltimore, all right? He still ran the Klan from within the prison through his Grand Claylif, his Vice Dragon. In my adult years, he got busted again 
this time for assault with intent to murder two black men with a shotgun. He did three years in prison. Um, I contacted him. I wrote him a letter in prison. I want to interview him. I never met him, but I want to sit him down and find out, you know, what, what is going on with you, man? You know, why are you wanting to bomb synagogues and, and shoot black people? I want to ask him face to face, tell me. So he wrote back and said, okay, fine. So he did. And, uh, and we met, and you know, he was a very angry, very angry individual. His name is Bob White, Robert White. And uh, anyway, um, over time, he began changing the more he associated with me. Today, I own his robe and hood, as you see. A Klansman has to, or Klanswoman, for that matter, has to have a job. It's just a title. It's like Boy Scout leader. You, you have a regular job. You know, you gotta pay your mortgage or your rent or whatever. His job, while he was head of the Klan, was Baltimore City police officer. This is his uniform. He was not an undercover cop in the Klan. He was a bona fide Klansman on the police force. So you wonder why the police and black people in Baltimore have so much trouble? There are more. He's, he wasn't the only one. And he's told me that. Okay. I have lived in the future. I've seen what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Patience is, is what will get us there. But now, patience does not mean sitting around on your butt and doing nothing and just waiting. No, you have to be proactive. And the problem with this country is we are reactive. Mm -hmm. And to prove it, Right now, a lot of conversations have been sparked and have been started and groups formed to address these very topics post-election because they've seen all this stuff, mm -hmm. you know, come out of the woodwork. Well, I'll tell you what, like I said, it's not new. I've been seeing it because I've been doing this for 30 years. So, more, you know, more people are seeing it because they, they turned a blind eye to it and they think it's brand new. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at least one good thing about this presidency is it has brought all this stuff out. And you cannot address what you can't see. Racism can be eradicated. Mm -hmm. White supremacy can be eradicated. It's gonna take time. But we are slowly seeing it diminish. Now, as I point out, um, not everybody is gonna stop hating being racist or being violent. There will be those who will go to their graves um, with that attitude and, and being that way. But if, you can, if, if one person changes, then a generation changes. And that's very important. And it's high time, you know, that we get to know each other. Stop hiding and, and ignoring the Klan. Why, why is the Klan still here? Maybe because we have ignored them. You know, whatever other techniques that we've tried have not worked. They're still here. But at least what I'm doing has proven to work. Now, has it gotten rid of the whole Klan? No. But one by one by one, people are changing. People are seeing things that they otherwise would not see. And people will say to me, Daryl, you know, I don't have time for that. I don't have patience to sit down like that and deal with people, you know, that kind of ignorance. Well, you know what? We all need to grow some patience. And I had to wait 12 to 15 years when I lived in the future overseas for that beautiful scenario to come to my own country. There's no overnight uh, success, you know, with that kind of thing. 12 to 15 years, I was patient. And now that scenario is here in the classrooms. Abortion, nuclear weapons, global warming, uh, the new presidency, the war in Iraq, whatever is a hot topic. You're going to be on one side, somebody else is going to be on the other side. You're not going to achieve anything unless you listen to each other and give each other a platform. This podcast is hosted, recorded, and produced by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. Until next time, thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>